welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Adam Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of brain-machine interfaces. So let's just get right into it. Uh, Madam, why right now, why is it such an important topic? So this past week, Elon Musk unveiled the first commercially viable version of Neuralink. And this is a pretty incredible unveiling on several dimensions. So for one, it has a thousand times the amount of electrodes as there currently are in the best FDA approved brain machine interfaces. So the, uh, the amount of signals that it's able to take in mm-hmm. is just far beyond anything we've had thus far. Also, it's minimally invasive. If you, you know, go on YouTube and look at some of the other BMIs that have been featured, they all have this very, like, you go in and you surgically change things in the brain. And then oftentimes you have to actually plug in the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the interface to the brain. And that mm-hmm. has issues where you could get infection and also it's just not a great user experience. So mm-hmm. his surgery is fully robotic, minimally invasive, fully automated. Yeah. So basically just like LASIK in like a 20 minute surgery or something, they specifically implant each of the little sensor electrodes into the exact right spot in your brain so that it doesn't hit any blood vessels or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then what you get at the end is this wireless connection that sits behind your ear so that you can have full connectivity to your phone, to whatever else. And if you ever Mm -hmm. want to unplug, you can just, you know, take that out. Yeah. And I mean, the idea is you want to get rid of the neurosur- the neurosurgeon in this whole process because right. if you need if you need a neurosurgeon when you're trying to improve to insert these electrodes in your brain then it's not scalable at all so that's yeah. one of the things that uh, the visionary Elon Musk you know he just that's what he wants to do is bring it to the masses so he tries to break down those barriers and it's also why I'm so excited about this technology is because someone like him is sort of the visionary to kind of make it um, market viable, mm-hmm. but you've also got really smart people behind the scenes. Like when I when I heard all the other uh, scientists and presidents and everyone else that are talking um, yeah. and on the Neuralink team, it was really impressive to hear that. Like the robot, um, you said that they, they insert automatically. The one thing that I didn't even think about before I saw the video is when your uh, heart is pumping, your the blood vessels in your brain are pulsing and they're mm. moving so that the machine has to like automatically adjust and make sure it doesn't you know try to hit something where a blood vessel wasn't a second ago and now it is like it's oh, always trying to adjust and the tech is just super cool uh, maybe we talk a little bit about what a brain machine interface actually is like we're talking right. about electrodes we're talking about all this stuff but what like why why yeah. electrodes Totally. So I think with this, it's helpful. Well, uh, first, I'll give you a really quick answer, which is just that the initial use cases are people who are paraplegic and they cannot move their limbs or they cannot type on a computer or something like that. So for those types of people, this is a complete game changer. They can basically regain their motor senses by using a brain machine interface like this. But I think the the more full fleshed out answer, because that's only in the short term. In the long run, this is by no means limited to paraplegics. It could be something that yeah. could eventually be something that everyone has. And I think it's useful to look at the history of how these have been used up until now. So, you know, at 50,000 BC, that's when the first full human language, the spoken language, was mm-hmm. in place. And not a whole lot has happened since then. Um, as far as getting more direct in our communications, like we can communicate over longer distances now, whether by telephone Mm -hmm. or or computer or written books or whatever, but we can't communicate any more quickly than we could Mm -hmm. in 50,000 BC. And when you think about what the process of communication is, like I have this thought in my head around what my opinion is of let's say like climate change. And then I have to transmit everything I think about that, about that topic to you. And, but what you're basically doing is you're compressing all of those nuanced thoughts 
into just a few mm. words so that it can be transmissible to you. Yeah. And so much gets lost in that transmission. Yeah, it's like an approximation of what you're actually thinking. Words are an approximation. But what if you could like actually decode the neural signals in your brain of what what you truly think? What is the meaning of climate change in your mind from an electrical standpoint or a neural, you know, chemical standpoint? Right. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, so from that point of view, it's like we had the era of no communication at all before language developed. Then we had the era of compressed communication, which is everything from the time language developed until like right now. And mm -hmm. in the future, we're going to have the era of direct brain to brain or brain to computer communication where I mm -hmm. can have you can say, hey, Matamor, how was that? You know, that movie Midsommar. And <laughs> I can say rather than just saying like, oh, it was good. It was kind of creepy, but it was interesting, like all of these very vague words. Instead, I can just transmit the specific representation that the movie has in my mind to mm -hmm. you with a totally lossless or at least almost entirely lossless yeah. transmission. Yeah, I mean, the only loss would be where your memory is faulty. Obviously, mm -hmm. this is in the, the far case when we can truly decode the signals of your brain because you know what the machine interface the brain machine interface is actually doing is these electrodes will read the electrical signals from neuron to neuron right. and right now what neuralink did like you said is they have more electrodes than you know the other fda approved uh, brain machine interfaces and it's like the first step in the process to get to a point where we can read almost all or all of your brain your brain's uh, neurons and you can yeah. truly decode what's happening in the mind right so that would be like a, be... a whole brain emulation but uh -huh. right now the only areas that we have mapped out well for the human brain are the motor cortex the visual mm -hmm. cortex and the audio cortex mm -hmm. because those are really easy in experiments to to say like you know, yeah. to move in a particular way and then map out where your brain fires or to see something on a particular place in the screen and then map out where that fires in your brain. It's a lot more difficult to map out abstract concepts or emotions because everyone has a neuroplasticity. So everyone's brain is always evolving and therefore mm -hmm. no two brains are entirely the same. But for fundamental use cases like, you know, moving your hands and seeing things and hearing things. Yeah. One of the things the lead scientist was talking about um, on the Neuralink presentation is that even if you try to do the same exact thing twice, your own brain does not represent that motion or that thought the same way every single time. Mm -hmm. There's there's this stochasticity or this randomness to the way that neurons fire, but your brain can adapt to anything. It can still decode this, these sort of random signals into something that means movement or means some sort of concept or some sort of visual stimulus. It's just right. your brain is so um, able to adapt to new things, which is why you can have these prosthetic limbs and your brain just learns how to control fingers of a machine without totally. even um, yeah, that was you know, one of the knowing most... how to do it. That was one of the most incredible things to me in researching this is that you're learning how to work with this computer while the computer itself is learning how to work with you. So there is a learning curve when you first implement these things, but you get better and better over time. And like the, I saw one video of this guy who has a BMI implanted because he's a paraplegic and mm -hmm. he moves around his, his mouse on a keyboard and he clicks. And they asked him, they said, what are you actually thinking about when you're making these movements? And he says, well, when I'm moving the mouse, I am, what I found to be the most effective is to think of a pool stick, like you're aiming at a cue ball and you sort of pull back and you move and then you, you move forward. Mm -hmm. And when he thinks about clicking, he imagines his right hand snapping and he says that always works. But if he thinks of some, some other movement, like thinks of like tapping his hand, it doesn't yeah. work as well. And over time, he, mm. he like f stops even thinking about it as like a pool stick. It almost becomes like its own thing because he's fully adjusted to it. And there's a true 
symbiosis in place. Um, mm. And I'll just give one other example that I thought was interesting is they did an experiment with two mice and one mouse was in the US, one was in the UK. And the mouse in the UK had this transparent box so he could see which box had the food in it. But mm. in the US, the boxes were covered. So he didn't okay. know, but only the mouse in the US was able to choose which box to unopen. Only he had the button. And they connected their the mice's brain to each other. And, you know, early on, they had very little success. But the more times they ran the experiment, the more success it had to the point where now the learnings of the mouse in the UK transmitted to the mouse in the US. The mouse in the US makes the decision and then they get the food at a much higher rate than they would if it was just, you know, random testing. Wow, so. that's really interesting. So is it just like a over the internet sort of communication? Um, yeah, they just hooked up their synapses so that basically when one synapse fires in the mouse's brain in the UK, uh, when he sees the box that has the food in it, it also stimulates the neuron in the US mouse's brain, and then he makes the decision. And that's, you know, those that's an example of two different types of applications where one is the read and the other is the write. The reading is like, yeah. is like taking in the information, taking in the, the synapses that fi are firing. And then mm -hmm. the writing are actually making a decision or like, in, like affecting something, which is the U.S. mouse actually deciding to open the, the correct box. Yeah. And both of those, the read and the write, both have really important consequences. Like, for example, just understanding the brain, we probably don't need much in the short term, like in the next five years, more than reading. At least that I think it's. I think it might be a little dangerous in a lot of cases besides like these edge cases like quadriplegics like they're go that's going to be Neuralink's kind of first Well Neuralink's into. electrodes are read and write already. I I know they are. Yeah. And that that's one of the things that's actually I'm a little scared of how <laughs> that how the brain might uh, respond to that. I know that, you know, th they're the scientists. I I think that they're going to do what's best, but um just having the read capability to understand what's going on in different scenarios, understand what parts of the brain fire in a lot, um, in a lot more or with higher fidelity, I guess, than mm -hmm. what we've previously been able to do. I think that's going to probably skyrocket the advancements in neuroscience. And that's something that I find really interesting too, because the brain is this mystery and totally. Neuralink, Neuralink can be one of these companies that, gives us a giant leap forward. And that's what I'm really excited about um, for one. And then in the long term, when you can actually write into the brain, if you have, you know, these <laughs> these electrodes where you can stimulate uh, some some pattern of firing, you could potentially cure diseases like depression where your your mind is just in this cycle of negativity. Maybe this write capability can break you out of this negativity cycle or yeah. with schizophrenia or OCD and you know, Parkinson's the, yeah. people with seizures, people with addiction, also people yeah. who are murderers. It may make us rethink the whole idea of rehabilitation for criminals, people who oh, have yeah. psychoses. And mm -hmm. so it just, that's one thing that struck me too, is that it just makes you rethink everything because you realize that, our brain pretty much already is in a vat by itself in the sense that it's in your skull and everything that's going on here, these are all the world of forms, like Maya, mm -hmm. as they call in the Hindu tradition, where mm -hmm. we're really just, everything is happening inside our brains and we're getting all of these impulses and then we create this world of forms and you can sort of cut to the chase and just go directly into the brain rather than mm -hmm. trying to modify the world of forms itself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really interesting, too. And kind of to go back to that learning concept that we were talking about earlier, where the the mice learn together, the brain-machine interface learns in conjunction with the um, human counterpart. That's the same thing that babies do. They come out of the womb, and they have to learn how to interact with this mm -hmm. outside world. And if, if our brains... I mean, we do know that our brains are extremely adaptable. Mm. Uh, you know, there's the there's our famous cases where people had 
um, giant stakes that went straight through their brain and they lived and their brain just kind of adapted to it. They figured out, I mean, they obviously had some issues, but your brain can adapt to these extreme cases. And if it can adapt to um, a neural lace or, you know, the, this mesh in your mind, um, you can start to do some really, really fascinating things with that. Like, oh, for yeah. example, um, I don't know if we want to get into some use cases of this in the in the future, but one of the things that first came to mind is, let's say you were talking to somebody from another country and didn't speak their language. You wouldn't necessarily need this clunky translator, like um, an AI translator that you would like hold up to them and then it would read it out to you. Mm -hmm. What you could do is directly hear what they're saying. Your current mind wouldn't really understand and couldn't convert their words into meaning. But, but the if digital you had, tertiary layer would translate it. Yeah, yeah, it would translate it into brain signals. So what they're saying can be stimulated in your mind in some sort of meaningful way. So you would understand what they're saying without actually knowing the language. You know, that's that's one of those things that, you know. So when, in, your, when your girlfriend tells you she's not upset, it translates to <laughs> I am upset. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, but the, the whole concept of learning to have a true symbiosis with an artificial layer is really fascinating and not as far off as it seems. And when you think about your phone, I mean, Elon's made this point many times, but it's we're already cyborgs. If you leave your house and you forget your phone at home, it's like you immediately have this sense of anxiety and loss and you're like, oh shit, do I really even know the best way to get to work? Like, I don't know what the traffic conditions are. What time is it? Are people trying to communicate with me? Like, oh, I want to look something up. Oh, I wanted to listen to this podcast. It's like all of these things that you're so used to having on hand at, at the moment's mm -hmm. notice, you don't have it anymore. And brain machine interfaces are really just taking that to the next level where it's not it's not being mediated by you having to move around your fingers mm -hmm. or even having to verbalize to, you know, ask your smart assistant a question. Mm -hmm. You can instead just think it without having any sort of compression of what you really want. And then mm -hmm. that can be made into reality, whether through actions on a screen or even potentially actions in the real physical world. Yeah. And that's one of the things that Elon Musk was talking about in his early, you know, conceptualizations of Neuralink. He he just wants to remove this bottleneck that is like our he caught you know our little meat sticks that are mm -hmm. um, like our our bandwidth for typing on a phone is so low that we yeah. can't we can't really make the most out of things. If if we could somehow interface with computers as fast as our brain can think then we're you know poised for some really extreme uh human evolution i think oh, like yeah. that's it's one of those things that can take us to the next level and there's the whole there's also the whole conversation about merging with ai however we conceptualize that but right. it's one of those things that we kind of need before we can move to this next you know human 2.0 or you know beyond right yeah i get even more excited about collaborating with computers in real time through thought than i mm -hmm. even am about collaborating with other humans because yeah. if you think about like if you're a pixar animator and you have mm -hmm. this fantastic idea for a movie or a sequence in a movie and it's mm -hmm. in your mind you know exactly what you want it to be but then you have to spend the countless painstaking mm. hours actually designing every little movement of all of these characters and if you could yeah. instead just your computer could read what you're visualizing and then create mm. the animation for you or you could imagine mm. like you know on twitter there was recently trending the 10x engineers or 10x developers which is basically like if you have a developer on your team that really kicks ass it's like the same thing as hiring 10 developers because just the level of capability is so much greater. We could have 1,000x, 100,000x developers where essentially one, per, one smart dude is able to visualize exactly what functionality the site or mm -hmm. the app should have. And then your computer assistant basically just writes all the code for you, does all the 
bug testing and QA testing for you. And you just need to be like sort of the mastermind behind it. Yeah, that would be a complete revolution for work. Like that would just change what it means to be, you know, a, a professional in this case. Like the the lag and the the feedback loop that you have when you're trying to create something new is so slow because of everything that you just outlined. Mm-hmm. It's it's really cool to think about what would happen. I mean, the brain can create things out of thin air. You can imagine something that's never existed before. If you could well, actually... I'm not well, totally sure there because, because everything is based on... Well, this gets into a philosophical question, but many philosophers would say that anything you can imagine is based on some perception that you've had in your life. Okay, so I'll... I'll you can imagine do, a new combination that, that hasn't been combined yes. in that particular way. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. It's, right. it's not like you create something totally new. You're building off of your experience. You're building off of other people's experience. But if you can... Um, instantly imagine some new combination of things or a new idea basically is what I'm getting at. This brain machine interface is a way to bring that to reality way faster than is currently possible. And that's something that can be done with just writing code, starting a tech company. Like you could be a one man army essentially in terms of creating uh, tech products. Right. Yeah. So, I think we should talk now a little bit about the reason why Elon Musk is doing this, because he already has enough on his plate with SpaceX and Tesla. (laughs) What's the real goal behind Neuralink and what's the strategy? And for this, I think it's really helpful to think of, you know, Wait But Why put together a really good post about this where there's a diagram. Maybe I'll share it on our Twitter, but it shows that all of Elon Musk's strategies it always starts with a spark that will create a huge innovation that will actually lead to a sustainable business model where they'll be able to get enough revenue so they can then create their the product that will actually further their end goal. Mm-hmm. And so with Neuralink, basically the starting point is that they're creating a brain machine interface that can initially be used for people today who have seizures, who are paraplegics, people who mm-hmm. really need it. And then once that has enough traction and they're able to get enough revenue, then mass adoption will become pretty mainstream. So Mm -hmm. this is like you could imagine our kids or maybe our kids' kids where it's just standard practice to have a non-invasive BMI, you know, interface. Mm -hmm. And then once that has has become natural where it doesn't feel any longer like there's this extra layer that's separate from you, but it actually starts to feel truly like it is you. That's when there's actually the symbiosis of AI and human Mm -hmm. intelligence, which Elon talks about. And the reason he's trying to attain that symbiosis is because he believes that will lead to widespread human AI integration, integration, which will help us to increase the chances that earthlings will be able to survive and have a better future given all the challenges of climate change nuclear war runaway ai Mm -hmm. you know nanotechnology biotechnology all of these things that are potential uh you know black balls from the urn of invention as nick Mm -hmm. bostrom would put it Mm -hmm. so that's his reason what do you like what's your take on the nobility of that mission and the need for that mission at this point in history so i think i agree that um that's i love the way that he approaches all of these things like tesla everything starts with like a very basic idea that um is commercially viable and then it then he goes for broad market uh, adoption um one thing that I've sort of changed my mind on recently is how um, close general AI is. Uh, after listening to Naval uh, Ravikant's um, perspective on this, I, I sort of thought that, well, maybe, maybe AI is further out than we think because your brain 
has more to it than just binary impulses. And that's one of the things that I was a little bit, um, I know that Neuralink is kind of in its early stages, but Mm -hmm. I think that there's going to be more to it than just converting your analog brain signals to a digital like binary code and then doing something with that. But again, this is like the very early stages. So it's, it's, yeah, it may require a quantum computer to fully realize that vision. And and that may take 20, 30, 40 years. But I do think it is something that we need to do, especially if we want to advance humanity as fast as possible and as Mm -hmm. as efficiently as possible and as safely as possible because even if there's not general ai there's still a lot of bad things that can happen with good narrow ai like we've talked about before Um, and if we can somehow have more control over it and make it less of a black box then we can truly understand what's going on and understand you know the the process of AI is coming to certain decisions, then I think we're in a better situation. Um, and then we can, once we understand it, once we can measure it, sort of like the famous saying, what gets measured gets managed. Mm-hmm. If we can't measure how an AI is making certain decisions, then we're not going to be able to manage it effectively. Right. And that's where it comes in with Elon's quote that if we don't do something like this right now, we can be left behind. That a brain machine interface is necessary if we even want the option of merging with AI so that we can have some meaningful input in how society is governed and not just hope for the best. Yeah, and the thing that that can help do as well and why I do think it's it's a cause worth pursuing with, you know, as as much um you know, in, integrity or as much um fervor. Sp- fervor, yeah, that's the right word. Um as possible we need to make sure that everybody has access to something like this. If it's something that only the rich and powerful have access to, then we can very quickly get to an extreme. (laughs) Yeah. We would be seeing inequality at the level of like, um, altered carbon where there's like trillionaires and people that are still living on like a hundred dollars a month or something. So there's, there's just a lot that we can, um, we need to do. And I think that, Neuralink is one step in the progression. I hope that there's going to be a ton of companies that start working on this and start to realize that, okay, this is a profitable space to be in. You know, that's, we can take advantage of capitalism and let the market kind of uh, make as many advancements here as possible. I do think that that is not necessarily um, going to lead to only goods. possibilities yeah we can so talk let, about let's that, talk but. about some of the dangers and challenges because this gets mm-hmm. interesting and the first one i want to bring up is something that's sort of the perspective i had before i started really delving into this i have a different perspective now but mm-hmm. that's basically the notion that why do i need to think more quickly than i can already speak like how much more, mm-hmm. how much, how useful is it to be able to think and then have something happen versus just being able to talk and ask your, your AI? And, and is that worth the invasiveness of having something in your brain, even if it's a minimally invasive surgery? Mm-hmm. Like it's hard for me to imagine as someone living in 2019 wanting to have further connectivity to my phone or to computers. I already got enough screen time. If anything, I want less screen time. Yeah. And that less screen time, from my view, is what would actually make me operate more efficiently. So what would you say to that, someone who has that point of view? I mean, I think... It's just that it's not there yet, that once, like... Because uh, in Neuralink's presentation, they have a pretty simple smartphone app that has pretty simple functionality, so you can control the interface between Mm -hmm. your brain machine interface and the computer that it's affecting but it's pretty minimal like i don't i don't know how useful it would be for me to scroll around and do stuff like that i can see that it's a total game changer for someone who's a paraplegic yeah but here's how my perspective has changed after watching videos of people going through this process and learning there's such an intense interplay between the machine and the brain that it just 
I have no idea what it's like to think with a computer. It's not the same as how we operate with computers today. It's a fundamentally different type of interaction. And Mm. it's hard to cap the potential of that type of interaction, especially since all of the videos I watched of people who currently have brain machine implants, they Mm. have like 100 electrodes, like 250 electrodes max. The Neuralink uh, first version has a thousand electrodes per chip and it has up to 10 chips. And this is just the first version. Mm -hmm. They're doing human trials next year. They're probably gonna have, you know, many other versions with potentially millions of electrodes. So I guess that that was just one misconception, misconception I wanted to point out that it's a lot more than just moving, doing stuff on your phone. Right. Yeah. And it's so hard for us to even conceptualize what it means. Like you said, it's it's so different and so foreign to the way that we interact with anything. But if you can imagine being able to think almost like two of you, like twins, but you're connected and you're kind Mm -hmm. of thinking at the same time and you're it's almost like a dialogue. But one of the things that we talked about is how slow and approximate um, speech is Mm -hmm. really, if you have a thought, you don't need like a time series of words. It's really just a concept, a single concept that you can immediately translate to a computer, for example, or translate to another person. And I want to know what it would feel like to be able to have this interplay. Yeah, me too. And I think, I think later in life, uh, I'm, I don't count myself as someone who's going to be a early adopter of this technology. But it is something that. But I you know, think, maybe when you and I are in our 80s and we're starting to lose our memory, and mm-hmm. our hearing. Yeah. Why not? Right. Yeah, and I'm sure there will be a ton of advancements in the next, yeah. you know, 70 years, or you know, okay, we're not 15. In the next 60 years, <laughs> then, um, it's, it's just going to be a really uh, interesting time to be alive and. T- I don't know. I, I think I sort of had the same misconception as you where I was like, yeah, I, I don't know, like how much faster is this actually going to make my, right. my process? So, so I can spend more time on Twitter. <laughs> 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 no, but yeah. I, and I also think to your point, there are probably going to be some interesting software developments where, like you said, it's like you're having a conversation with two people inside your head, except one of them is this all-knowing computer that has all the world's knowledge accessible to it. I imagine that there are going to be operating systems, like in the movie Her, where your mm-hmm. brain machine interface has a certain personality that you like, and maybe you mm-hmm. get to select which persona, maybe you want like a Brit- yeah. British Winston Churchill man as your BMI, or, or maybe you want like... <laughs> more of like an Alan Watts or maybe you want uh, Scarlett Johansson like mm-hmm. as from her. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, I, I thought that was interesting. But uh, let's go on to the next big danger slash potential misconception. And this is one that I do think is a misconception, but I don't want to write it off completely. And that is the idea that there will be a loss of self from brain machine interfaces. I've read articles mm-hmm. where people are concerned that if everyone's brains are connected, it could turn into some sort of hive mind where you sort of lose your individuality and you're less of the person that we are today rather than being more of the person that you are today. Yeah, um, that's a hard and sort of deep philosophical question of what's going to happen when this, you know, if, if this takes over. But my first reaction is we we really are all connected in some way already mm-hmm. are you know is this going to just lower the the barrier between you and other or can you still maintain that and i right. think i do think that we will be able to maintain that because you still have your mind your mind is where it's like the well at least you know Maybe not exactly your mind. Like there's there's some other Simulation philosophical theory. questions, but but <laughs> your body your body is where your ego resides, and what makes you an individual, what makes you different from you know other people, and have more unique thoughts. Your so your mind is still going to be unique. You're just going to also be able to tap into the collective knowledge of everything 
more quickly than others. Like if we're talking far future, we might see the education system so revamped that you don't go through and you learn these concepts. You just know the concepts because you have access to them. Yeah. And each individual is sort of like this this scientist that's creating new things based on their own individual individuality. Like you download um, Kung Fu like in the Matrix. Yeah. I mean, I mean what if you could so just store right. unlimited scales in the cloud and then whenever you need them, you just download them and use them in the moment? I mean, it literally I literally could turn you into like a god almost but but th but that's why people are concerned about their loss of self because if it becomes such a modular system you can see how some people would be concerned about well am i really me or, or a simpler version is let's say i'm an alcoholic and part of my big identity is that i'm an alcoholic because this horrible thing happened when i was younger mm -hmm. and then you know it gets to the point where i'm almost suicidal and so i get a brain machine implant where it is a right function. So basically, it removes my desire to have alcohol. And then it's like, okay, yes, on one hand, I'm in a much better position. I'm not suicidal. I'm not alcoholic. My family and friends probably think I'm doing much greater, like much better. But am I really still myself since that was such a part of my initial identity? And you might say, no, yeah, you're still yourself. That was a disease. Alcoholism is a disease. But it's hard to draw the line, right? Like, how much can you change yourself and still consider yourself yourself? Like, if you say, okay, I want to go into work mode right now, and you can just press a button on your phone, and all of a sudden you're, like, fully in work mode. You're not distracted at all. <laughs> and then, like, you're like, okay, now I want to go into lovemaking mode. <laughs> and you're like, fully, in, like, you know what I mean? It's kind of, yeah. it's a little, you can see why people think it's unnatural. But on the other side, what Elon Musk and others would say is that you're actually expanding your volition. You're expanding your sense of self and the ability mm -hmm. for your sense of self to operate. Because it's part of, it's, the brain machine interface is on the neocortex. It's not in the monkey brain or the reptilian brain. It's in the most developed part of our brain. And at so, least for now. At least for now. <laughs> so you're, you're sort of heightening the power of that. And maybe because I am the one that says, I don't want to be an alcoholic, I'm affecting the truest sense of my free will, and I'm essentially overriding the reptilian or the mammalian brain in favor of the human neocortex. And that's what, at least from the research I've done with the experts that have been interviewed, that's what they seem to think is that it would actually expand your volition rather than narrow it and create a hive mind. But yeah, and I don't see, yeah, I don't see much of a difference between that and using external substances like caffeine or alcohol. Like, that's alcohol, a good point. That's, that's another, you know, if you want to get out of, you know, your current mindset, for example, some people will turn to alcohol and mm -hmm. they use that as a tool to, to change something, to get out of, you know, a, a depressive state or whatever the reasons are mm -hmm. to, to drink alcohol. Or um, maybe you smoke a joint or maybe you drink caffeine to get in work mode or maybe, right. you know, there's a lot of you substances meditate. that we, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be, you know, a a substance of some sort, but people do still use external stimuli to, you know, affect some sort of mind altering, um, change. Right. And, and yeah. I, I don't see it being that much different. It's, it's just a more, um, real and a more effective version of changing your state. Okay. I agree. Let's move on to the next one, Okay, which is that Oh man, does this mean that everyone can hear my thoughts? What the hell? Aren't I going to be hearing chatter all the time? People are going to be reading my private thoughts. This is going to be terrible. <laughs> what would you say to those people? Uh, well, I, I will start off by saying we should at least be aware that if Computers your can mind... Be hacked. Yeah, if your mind can be at least read or some signals can be read there is at least someone can make an approximation of what you're thinking. And this can be used for nefarious purposes. Definitely. And you don't even need a brain machine interface. You could just have electrodes on the surface of your scalp yeah. 
and still yeah. know some basic things about what that person is thinking. But it's if you could yeah. hack directly into the stream of data from your BMI, that's a much deeper level of understanding someone's thoughts. Yeah, and I don't think that it's like all of the chatter. Like, it's not like you're going to be walking around reading people's minds, like you see in movies, where if someone can read minds, they're just like overloaded with, you know, other people's thoughts. And it, I think Jessica Jones was one of. Right. I saw that that uh, first season a while back, and there was somebody that could read minds, and it was you know. Yeah, uh, but but Elon's been pretty explicit in this area where he said that you have to opt in to share thoughts or to receive thoughts from someone. It doesn't just happen automatically. So mm -hmm. you have to think about what you want. And then that's the only time that that communication line would be open. So at least for the way that Elon intends it with Neuralink, there's not going to be someone can't like airdrop you their thoughts without your consent. You have to accept the airdrop just like you do with today's airdrop. Mm -hmm. So yeah, an and there's there's like a lot of uh, technological advancements that need to take place before you can even share thoughts or read right, thoughts. Right, right. Um, so that's a that's a far out thing that I think is probably on the orders of decades away to be able to actually read people's thoughts in a coherent manner. Because one of the things, one of the reasons I don't think it's that big of a deal, especially in the short term is earlier we were talking about how there's this learning process. Mm -hmm. um, the way that one person represents a concept in their mind is probably totally different from the way that you represent some concept in your mind. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some way to seamlessly translate me someone right. else's meaning to your own meaning, then you know there, there's just a lot of things yeah, like that take I think a, Like take a, a Trump supporter's view of the word socialism and then take like a someone who loves AOC and their view of the word socialism they're like completely mm -hmm. different so that's part of why words are so inefficient when we're trying to have these nuanced mm -hmm. conversations and that's why you hear the word nuance so much on Twitter is because you cannot have nuance on Twitter because <laughs> you're condensing all of these complex thoughts into just a few you know just a handful of characters and mm -hmm. every word is just itself a compression of, you know, yeah. all of these disparate ideas that people have in their minds. And the other thing I would I would say to take that even further is you could have an AOC supporter and another AOC supporter that also have they think of socialism in the same way. The neural patterns between those two are probably totally different mm. the way that those concepts are because each person went through their own development process and, and right. the way that their brains fire are totally different. The way that their brains developed were totally different. Yeah, it's like in, in uh, Westworld, how they talk about you have this cornerstone of your identity mm -hmm. and everything's sort of built around that. It's the same with real babies where the early experiences you have, they mm -hmm. create your sense of meaning and then you sort of build around that there's a f fantastic book about that called surfaces and surfaces and essences mm. which is about how every mm. concept is either a surface or like there's every word is like the surface of a concept and but then there's the actual essence of that concept which mm. is sort of what's shared by everyone and so that's sort of what brain machine interfaces are doing is they're getting right to the essence yeah and they're not just like dancing around on the surface Mm -hmm. So the other, I think we should get into the scenarios, but I'll, the final two dangers from my point of view, which are pretty scary, are evil masterminds. So this technology, just like it can be used for good, can also be used for evil and to a far greater degree. Mm -hmm. Like think about ISIS without the Internet. It wouldn't be very successful. The mm -hmm. fact that they can communicate on Telegram is huge for their success. If you gave ISIS brain machine interfaces, that's real scary. Yeah. And then I the, mean, and then the final okay. one I'll just say is corruption, corrupt government and, you know, those are sort of the two like sides of the surveillance state kind of. Yeah, like if is that you're, what you're saying the surveillance state or? Right. I mean, for instance, it doesn't even ha yeah, like in China for instance, 
if brain machine interfaces become mainstream, it seems more than likely that certain thoughts would not be allowed. There would be thought crimes. You cannot transmit thoughts about uprising. You cannot transmit even negative thoughts about certain leaders. Maybe when those thoughts are transmitted, they're intercepted and analyzed, and then they're flagged if an inappropriate thought occurs. So that would be the side of, oh shit, like your actual government could be using brain machine interface technology and data for nefarious ends. And then on the terrorist side, it could be like, okay, yeah, everything is great as far as the main structure of society, but you can still have these evil masterminds that are now empowered with this new technology. So those are, those are probably the two biggest concerns that, that I have, but maybe yeah, we I, should get into that kind the, of gets into the worst case. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Justin, what is the worst case scenario for the future of brain machine interfaces? Worst case scenario. Oh man, yeah. So there, this was sort of a, a multifaceted thing, sort of like um, we were just talking about, because there's so many different use cases of brain machine interfaces. Um, so the the one that I initially thought about was a surveillance state, like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody could actually, or if some government could actually control what people were thinking. And this is, again, this is with read, what we just talked about was read-only permissions, for example. Yeah. If they had access to the tech and they had write permissions, they could literally control people yeah. and literally control what they do and what like they an think. An army of robotic ants marching it, to take yeah. over the world. Yeah, so it, it would be a hive mind, but it wouldn't be a hive mind in the sense that, you know, it's just an emergent property or a, a default property of brain machine interfaces. It would be a hive mind that's created by some central ruler, which is truly terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. And that, and if we look at, you know, organisms that are uh, run through some sort of hive concept like bees or ants for their um, scale, they're extremely efficient. And if, mm -hmm. if there's a ruler that can create a hive, like that would be, a pretty indomitable force, I think. Right. And um, it, it kind of gets at the, a lot of the trends we've talked about, they've revealed that a fascist regime is becoming increasingly dominant as a model of governance compared to democracies. Because democracies are messy, they're slow, they're bureaucratic, it takes time to vote on decisions, it takes time to enact those decisions, if you have a fascist regime, you can make a decision and instantly everyone has to obey the orders. And mm -hmm. what's, what's caused fascist regimes to fail in the past is that there hasn't been enough information flow for a single leader to be able to make decisions quickly enough. That's why mm -hmm. a more democratized system was much more efficient. But what we're seeing now is that it may become far more efficient and effective to have all the decisions coming out of one central control center than mm -hmm. to have this dispersed democratic control that we have in the West. Yeah, and that's that sort of sums up the worst case scenario um, in terms of governance. I mean, there are other worst case scenarios. You know, let's say that that does not happen. It could also be a, a case where only the rich have access to brain mm -hmm. machine interfaces. And that's sort of what I said earlier, where there's, I mean, totally unfathomable uh, inequality, where we have trillionaires in, you know, let's say in hundreds of years, we have quadrillionaires, if mm -hmm. we become a spacefaring species, and the, you know, the, the solar um, system economy is, you know, ridiculous, mm -hmm. and we can measure wealth in terms of, you know, trillions or quadrillions of dollars, that would just be, you know, one of those things where it's it's an extreme version of where we are now, where the, the wealthy mm -hmm. have a, a little bit more, or they have, in some cases, a lot more opportunity than the poorest of the poor. Um, and then warfare would be the last one, sort of like you were saying with, with like ma evil masterminds, where you have some groups that want to start wars and they're so effective at it because they're, they can, you know, interface with... Mm -hmm 
technology that you know they can be very yeah very this, strong. this just occurred to me actually but it, you know how there's international law that says that you can't you can't have an autonomous drone that has no human input going around killing people well, actually, I don't know if it's international law, but it's sort of an unspoken rule that no country so far mm -hmm. has had fully autonomous weapons that decide and execute on kill commands by mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. It does seem like a good workaround would be a brain machine interface drone pilot that has all of the benefits of a fully autonomous system that can make you know reaction times far better than any human but then mm -hmm. you can still have the human make the ethical decision of whether or not to take out this target and maybe incorporate other useful information. But I don't know, as you were talking yeah. about the fascist regime, I was just thinking about like how future of warfare could be. Yeah. I mean, that, that kind of gets into like Ender's Game territory. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, very good point. Where you've got, you know, this almost like a VR or AR controlled um, system that, yeah, that's that's really the future of warfare would be. We should do that um, episode. Yeah. yeah, we definitely should. Uh, so, what do you think on your worst case scenario? Right, my worst case is that it achieves the opposite objective from what Elon Musk has desired, meaning mm -hmm. it accelerates our own destruction rather than accelerating our ability to prevent our own destruction. Okay. And I think the way that that would manifest itself is the same instances that we've been talking about where either it's an issue with the state control or it's an issue with evil masterminds, terrorists, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm, I, although I will say that overall, after doing all the research, I feel a lot more positively about the future scenarios for this than I did before I started researching. That's good. Yeah. Um, well, do you want to maybe uh, get into the best case scenario then? Because yeah, yeah. I think it'd be interesting to linger on the best case for a little bit right. because there's a lot of use cases that are positive that we haven't touched on yet. And, you know, totally. maybe we just get into it. Best case scenario. Yeah, my best case, so I'll, I'll, I'll break it up by short term, mid term and long term. In the short mm -hmm. term, I believe it's going to be almost purely positive as far as the results, because all of the early use cases are going to be for people who really need this. People who had a debilitating disease or an accident, war veterans, mm -hmm. and to be able to have a robotic arm that truly feels and moves like your arm and you can control it in the same way that you can tr control your previous arm. And the same mm -hmm. thing for if you were blinded and now you have a robotic eye or, you know, the cochlear implants that we have today, everything sounds like Mickey Mouse voice, which is great if you're going between Mickey Mouse voice or no sounds at all. Mm -hmm. But with these brain machine interfaces, we'll be able to have the full range of sound maybe even yeah. more than the full range of sound. Maybe you can even hear what it's like to hear like a dog or, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, that was one of the things I was thinking about. Like if you could somehow get these um, so advanced where you could communicate with animals, like act and you know, they have simpler concepts most likely than we do what they're thinking, but if we could actually communicate. We also don't know for sure that we have simpler concepts or essences of our thoughts than dolphins or orcas, for right. example. We don't know actually how smart they or are. Fungi. And it could be. <laughs> or fun Yeah, I mean, we don't really know yeah. what, what the situation is. Anyways, uh, uh, keep going. On. Yeah, so going beyond, so in the short term, it would just be bringing everyone who's had some sort of debilitating state to come mm -hmm. up to full speed. The yep. next stage in the medium term would be upgrading people beyond what's current what they're currently capable of and this is really exciting for me just as a professional to imagine how productive and how innovative you can be if you're an artist a graphic designer even if you're a marketer if you're a developer mm -hmm. for sure but if you just think about all the problems that have to be solved and all the ones we've addressed on this podcast like 
AI and the food crisis and climate change and how to save our oceans and space trash. And there's just so many things going on that our ability to take them on can be upgraded to an incredible degree. Mm -hmm. And then the furthest out in the long term, best case, it would be a situation where you have what Tim Urban calls the wizard hat. And the wizard hat is a full digital tertiary layer that is connected to your entire brain. So mm -hmm. essentially, this is no longer thinking of yourself as separate from the computer and you're interfacing with the computer. Mm -hmm. Instead, the computer is now part of you. When you say mm -hmm. I, you don't just mean your reptilian self, your mammalian self, your human self. You also mean your AI self. And mm -hmm. to be that type of being, it's, it's almost impossible to describe right now. So anything I can say about it's good, it's bad, it's scary, whatever, would be meaningless because I don't know what, it, what it's like. But I will say that after listening to Eric Weinstein's podcast on the portal, mm. this could be a portal, a portal to the next level of existence where almost like the way I envision the portal is like, when you're playing Pokemon on a Game Boy and you go into like a door and then it like transports you to the next level. It's yeah. like there are these certain areas of technology where there could be a portal to a broader range of conscious existence and conscious understanding, almost like going from 2D to 3D, going from 3D to 4D or even beyond that and even more dimensions. And one of the portals is almost certainly a brain machine interface. Another portal could be limitless energy through nuclear fusion. Another portal yeah. could be ultimate longevity where we've cured all yeah. diseases. We've cured aging. No one dies unless you want to die or some accident happens. Mm -hmm. This could be one of those portals that gets us out of this plane of existence and moves us into a higher plane of existence where we understand more, we're conscious of more, we're able to enjoy more, we're able to do more for our, our future and mm -hmm. for other earthlings, and ultimately we create a better future because we're simply more capable than we were before as earthlings. Mm -hmm. And it might turn out that being more capa capable makes humans or tran you know beyond humans, humans 2.0, um, better people and more yeah, moral people because yeah. there's the a lot of times says the ubermensch yeah it might turn out that having a better understanding of people and being more connected to people makes you know being a, a sociopath or a psychopath way less likely because mm -hmm. you actually can understand someone else's point of view because you can truly get whatever the essence of what their experience is and experience it yourself you know, it, there could be a, a safety mechanism, for example, if somebody wanted to commit some sort of violent crime that, you know, you, the, the offender automatically has to experience everything that they are, um, like dishing out essentially, you know, I don't know how that would work out, but there's, um, yeah, there's so many ways it could manifest itself, but really I think all we know <laughs> is that our capabilities, our capacity to affect society in a good way and a bad way will be to a far greater degree. Mm -hmm. So I think that then the next question is, what's the most likely direction that it will sway? Yeah. Well, let, let me talk a little bit on the best case yeah, yeah, uh, that yeah. I was thinking too. Um, I think with the, the portal concept where, you know, what, what is going to take us to the next level? And if we think about the actual use case of how we will be so much more effective, sort of like I mentioned earlier, is through knowing concepts sort of by default and knowing skills, knowing the foundations of things by default. So pretty much anyone in the future, you could be a 10 year old and know all there is to know about physics, math, everything else, because you just have access to that information. Mm. It's like the so common instead, core in yeah. microchip form. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, if you think about how inefficient the current education system is, like it takes years to learn the very, very basics of math. But mm -hmm. if you could somehow be a master or know 
all there is to know about the state of the art in every single field, then you can have a true cross pollination of these different ideas and these different fields. Because I think one of the things that we've seen and one of the things that Eric Weinstein was also talking about in his podcast with Joe Rogan is people and scientists are so siloed that they can't communicate Mm. like cross they can't cross pollinate with each other and they can't bounce ideas off of each other because they're so specialized. Like in order to read a paper on biology, you need to be a biologist in order to read a paper on physics. You need to be a physicist. So if you could somehow be a biologist, but understand all there is to know about chemistry, physics, yeah. math, everything else, or then, interface like, with the chemist and ideate to a far greater degree than you could yeah. if you're just using the jargon that each of your disciplines has, which don't necessarily translate well to the other person. But yeah, you then can, you get to the essence right. rather than rather than having the the approximation of all this jargon that means, you know, that's one of the annoying things about uh, these um, state of the art fields is they have these different words, but they mean different things in different contexts. Oh, yeah, especially law. Fields. Law is purposefully made to be as incomprehensible as possible. <laughs> so you have to hire a lawyer to to uncover yeah. what the meaning is. Yeah. So that's, I think, education and being able to truly augment the way that we think is going to be one of the best possible cases mm-hmm. for this. The other thing that I think is going to be really useful, maybe in the short term, and then eventually the long term, is to actually understand what's going on. Like, what is consciousness? Nobody knows. Right. But this is this is a, one of the early steps, I think, in being able to bridge the gap of our current understanding and what consciousness actually is. Oh, yeah. Or, or the theory of everything. Like, uh, yeah. you know, string theory hasn't really progressed much at all since it was developed Mm-hmm. you know in the 80s or, or whenever it was yeah. and the reason is that we can't test it through the scientific method because mm-hmm. the cost and of doing an experiment beyond the hadron collider is just uh you, you it's can't huge. yeah it's huge so and and it's it's unclear whether that would even give us the learnings that we want so yeah. physics has gone in such a theoretical direction that it's more important that it makes intellectual sense than it is that it can be tested. But the problem with that is that it's hard to communicate with someone else what your concept is of string theory with what their concept is of string theory. And then someone who's a naysayer, what is it about their understanding that's not matching up with your understanding? And Mm -hmm. you can hurl words at each other, but you're probably not gonna reach a good consensus. But if you could instead just get top people in their fields communicating the essence of what their understanding is, it could lead to a greater degree of understanding that could somehow be memorialized in knowledge and Mm -hmm. further our understanding of how this whole thing we call life works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things that I I think I think we'll have a better understanding of the theory of every I mean, just theories theories for everything and the theory of everything like the mm-hmm. physical structure that makes up uh, reality the so the one last use case that i think kind of fits into the best case scenario you could also view it as you know a dystopian future but i think we will be able to augment our experience and like heighten the experience of being a human whether mm-hmm. this is through uh, vr for example, if you, uh, if anyone has watched the most recent uh, Black Mirror season, the first episode where they put on these little chips mm-hmm. and go into a game, into a virtual real, uh, virtual world, um, the they can actually experience and feel things within this world. Like it's right. it's truly like another world. Um, and what I found interesting in the presentation, the Neuralink presentation was that the lead scientist was talking about how you can map out the haptic feedback. So you can um, Mm. figure out which parts of the brain correspond to different types of feelings. And this would essentially be, I think it could be dangerous if overused. This this gets to like the brain in a vat thing where any sensation you have in the real world, whether it's sexual pleasure or torture or confusion Mm -hmm. or whatever, 
you can stimulate the brain to have that type of reaction. Theoretically, I'm not saying we can do this today, mm -hmm. but theoretically you could. Yeah. And you could basically mm -hmm. create any sense of reality artificially through a brain machine interface. And so the yeah, possibilities are pretty endless there. Yeah, I think I think that would completely uh, reduce suffering, which isn't necess again, this isn't necessarily all good. You know, you you could totally get rid of suffering, but it might turn out that suffering is an essential part of being a human. At least some level of suffering is an essential part of being a human. It reminds and, me of the Matrix where they first the machines created a perfect world, but the humans wouldn't accept it. So instead they created a world modeled after the heyday of the human race, which was in the 1990s. <laughs> One of the things that I think could happen, so the same way that dreams and the REM sleep cycle happens is you might be dreaming for a couple of minutes in the real world, but the true experience within that dream feels like a very long time. Mm. It might turn out that with a brain machine interface, you could essentially run through different experiences in over the course of an, an evening, for example, and live many different lifetimes, mm. which is, I think, it's one of those things that I think would be super interesting. You could experience, you could, you know, put yourself through a life that's super easy and super happy and, you know, blissful. You could have, you could put yourself through an experience that is maybe uh, not as enjoyable and you could come out learning everything and having all of those experiences over the course of a night. So I just, yeah. it's one of those things where some, you might... I could see some scary things happening there too. Like, what's yeah. wrong with Justin? Oh, dude, he li he lived a hundred years last night. He was he had a really his he slayed the dragon, but then his the princess got killed, and he's just still really really uh, worked up about it. He's not really yeah, the I same. Mean, you might you might notice that he's starting to act like an old man <laughs> because we don't yet have medical technology that can make brains not degrade over time. Mm -hmm. That is still a very real limitation. So it might screw yeah. us up if we start messing with time before we can oh, yeah. make the appropriate medical uh, breakthroughs mm -hmm. as well. I, I think, honestly, it's going to be harder to get time in sync because our sense of time is just based on the real world. If we start to have a communication with a machine that is processing things many orders of magnitude beyond the speed that we're currently processing things like the time, the timing of those signals is going to be extremely important. I think when it comes right. to thought itself, there is still the, um, the early cases where that's not really an issue where we just need to, you know, figure out which, which fingers to move or which, you know, like how to stimulate certain parts of the brain to get them out of a certain depressive loop or schizophrenic loop or, you know, maybe uh, alter these certain parts of the brain so we can bring back some memories, um, mm -hmm. like for Parkinson's or uh, Alzheimer's patients. Um, but far future, you know, it, that could be a problem. Or you know, in the next couple decades, it might be a problem getting the the timing synced up with the machines and us because there is such a difference in how fast we process things. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, what do you think for the likely scenario? Most likely scenario. Yeah, my most likely <clears throat> scenario is pretty positive, actually. Mm -hmm. I think that we are going to work out a lot of the kinks as we go through this. I think just like with any breakthrough technology, there are going to be a few highly publicized disasters early on that will set us back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And especially just because the media frenzy goes so crazy over anything that could be perceived as dystopian. That's what we're, we, that's what we've seen with the headlines with Neuralink even today, even though pretty much all the early use cases are for people who seriously could improve their quality of life because they're paraplegic or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I feel pretty positive about it overall. I'm still not quite sure how long it will take for it to 
be something that everyone opts into, or at least like the majority of people in society opt into. Mm -hmm. It seems unlikely that people in our generation who grew up without cell phones and iPads from the time they were born would use it, at least until we start to have debilitating problems. So I think it's quite likely that you and I or, you know, people our age will use brain machine interfaces when we start to have issues, when we start to go blind, when we start to go deaf, when we start to lose Mm -hmm. our memory. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not going to be until the generation that grew up with a cyborg reality, meaning they have their phone and iPad with them from the time they're little. It's not going to be until that generation grows up that society as a whole will feel comfortable with this as, you know, as something that even if you're not a paraplegic, you would want. Mm -hmm. But that's not that far away. So I guess for my most likely scenario, it's that this becomes somewhat mainstream in the next 20 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that it's generally has positive implications. Although in the US, I should say it has positive implications. I'm I'm concerned when we think about how, especially China, just given their technological chops and the way they operate as a Mm -hmm. authoritarian regime. So that's that's my that's actually probably my biggest concern is how mm. un, how China specifically as a world power will use this technology and also given that China's kind of on the rise in a lot of ways like we've talked mm-hmm. about and how the U.S. is in decline in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. The scary thing to me is that if the dominant brain machine interface technology is something that allows for control from a government regime that's like real scary yeah but i don't I, know how likely it is it's so hard to say like what's the more likely uh, outcome i like to think yeah. that the good guys will win in the end i i would also like to think the same thing the i do think it's likely that i think china's gonna win the race on on, AI. on this Oh, well, just on brain machine interfaces. I think mm. I think they'll win the race in a lot of things, given the way that they can operate so much more effectively than we can. Um, I do see hope that we we tend to have an economy that is um, maybe a little more stable, which which could be good long term if this is a a many decade project, which I see mm-hmm. it being. Um, the so I do think that they will probably hit the, have this technology and test it on humans in in more obscure ways than we do initially, just mm-hmm. because they can. Um, so that's kind of like the bad part of the likely scenario. But I do think in the most likely scenario, it, it's going to make people so much more effective, and if everybody in a society like the US can have access to a, a machine that gets everybody on the same level, I do think that good ideas and better, um, just better decisions. Deci- yeah, all of that can be done more effectively with when you have a more individualistic and a more capitalistic type of uh, regime. Right. So it, yeah, I think I that think... that is ultimately the advantage that the West has against the East as far as our mm. culture is that the the level of innovation and the ability to have ideas that may fail and to keep coming up with new ideas even in the face of that potential failure, mm-hmm. that is one edge that may result in the West winning out in the brain machine interface AI co- competition. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I would not. I would not say that that's the likely outcome. I'm just saying that's. It's possible that that edge will lead us to being the dominant AI force. Yeah. But this, the current indicators, as you've said, are pretty pretty far in the opposite direction. Yeah. One thing I would say in terms of the far future, where I do see this going, is the evolution of brain machine interfaces going beyond just little electrodes in your brain. I honestly see the future of brain-machine interfaces getting to a point where instead of having little 
a mesh that's in your brain, I see them actually having artificial neurons that are part of this brain machine interface mm. where rather, so you actually have a more uh, realistic simulation of a neuron. So you can, you can have a, a more continuous or a more analog approach to these br brain machine interfaces rather than a, like a binary digital approach to the information right. that's being transmitted. And that's when we get to the point where we can start to see like true transhumanism. Like we, mm. we truly become cyborgs. We are, we are part machine. Right. Our, our biology is not just our biology. We have synthetic biology and synthetic neurons and maybe even synthetic cells everywhere. Like this, this can get to the point where we are no longer recognizable as humans mm. biologically. Um, we might look like humans, but there might be, there's probably going to be more to us in a couple hundred years than, um, than what we see now. So mm. that's sort of what I think it'll it transform lead to us ultimately. more than meets the eye. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'd love to hear what Alan Watts thinks about all this. He'd probably shake his head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be my guess. If, if he, you know, if he thought that this would reduce individual freedom, you know, that it, and it might, it might reduce individual freedom or individual I, I agency. I like to think that it will extend individual freedom and individual agency. It's like mm -hmm. there's all these eyes popping up all over the place, like mm -hmm. beings that have a sense of I, and you sort of, you start out with no sense of I, and then you develop it in your life. And this is a way of expanding and hopefully enlightening your sense of I so that you realize how interconnected all beings are and you're able to communicate the essence of what you are trying to communicate and vice versa and that therefore we'll be able to collectively create a future that is in line with what all of us desire rather than what a few powerful people at the top desire yeah i couldn't have said it better awesome well i think that's a good place to end it Thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been the future of brain machine happened, interfaces. What is currently and happening? We'll see you next time. And what will inevitably happen? The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future. Baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future. Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.